You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Maram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Gors Puya. Before we begin, we'd like to wish you all a wonderful 8th March International Women's Day. In this week's program, we'll interview Tasneem Khalil, Bangladeshi journalist and author. We'll also be talking about the elections in Iran, a Women's Protection Act in Pakistan and how it's anti-Islamic. ISIS and the use of clippers against women who are improperly veiled, Hasidic Jews and gender segregation, as well as a fatwa against research on women, cycling in Gaza, and of course, the brilliant unveiling movement and anti-compulsory veiling movement in Iran. Stay with us. In the past week, we have been hearing a lot about the stunning victory of the reformists in the elections in Iran. Of course, we need lots of commas, inverted commas, to even mention any of these things. Really, reformists, stunning victory, elections, I mean, when you look pinch at me, is it? <laughs> Am I dreaming? It's, it's, it's real, Maria. <laughs> and the more reality is divorced from the narrative of the election in Iran, the more outrageous it's become. Um, and you could see even the journalists are scratching their head. They say, look, this is complicated. <laughs> the situation is very complicated. We can't explain this. But, but that's the reality. When you look at the list, you'll see um, which one is the reformist one. Because when they, they jump between the list, if you can't get uh, sort of, uh, if you, get, you can't get into one list, they'll actually switch and move on to the other one. And I think everybody's confused about this. <laughs> I mean, the reality is, look, fundamentally there's no difference between the two factions they've said it themselves it's all about you know the strategy differences in strategy perhaps but all in order to maintain and safeguard an islamic system exactly and i think mohammed uh, khatami one of the um, leaders of the islamic regime said look personalities could change but the Islamic regime foundations and the strategy would never change. Yeah, and, the, and that's the reality of it. So, you know, they've, they've finished playing Islamic democracy after these elections. And again, they have started to step up the repression. We've got musicians, filmmakers. Uh, there's, there's several, Hossein Rajabian, uh, Mehdi Rajabian, his brother, Yusuf Emadi, who have been tortured, imprisoned for making films and for distributing music. And this is not a stop. You know, the rate of execution and arrest is continuously, continuously been increasing under the reformists, reformists. In uh, yeah. inverted comma, yeah. uh, president of the Islamic regime. You know, it is, is a joke. And I think part of this narrative is to continue to trade and work with the Islamic regime. Yeah. And it's, you have a, you know, an army of journalists trying to sort of justify this, yeah. uh, to create an illusion that there is, um, you know, there, there is change happening yeah. within the Islamic regime. We don't think so. Well, journalists need to do their job a little better, perhaps, uh, you know, instead of uh, just accepting the narrative that the regime has yeah. given. Yeah. And of course, I mean, I think it's just common sense. You cannot have a democratic system in a theocracy, in a dictatorship. It's clear. And of course, uh, you know, anything to do with Islam is just bad news when it comes in the state, when it comes in the law. There's been a great law that's been passed in the Punjab in Pakistan and um, in the province of Punjab, and it's called the Women's Protection Act. It's to protect women against sexual violence, psychological violence, domestic violence. Yeah. And of course, what's what's happened as a result of this wonderful law being passed? And a number of actually um, Islamic scholars and institutions have come out and said scholars. this is yes, uh, and this is against the tenets of the Islam mm -hmm. and the uh, Pakistani constitution. Yeah, it's it's they've they've said it's uh, it's uh, anti-Islam. Uh, one of the um, mullahs has said the whole law is wrong. And he, he, he did go on to say that it makes men insecure. I think he's worried about himself, <laughs> isn't he? I mean, and, and when you look at it, I think this is, you know, the law represents the true face of Pakistan. And uh, Pakistan 
women and various organizations have actually fought for many years to make this a law. And that's a success and needs to be celebrated. And, and needs to be protected before they roll it back again. Absolutely. Yeah. And the world needs to come, come, in, come out in support of this piece of legislation in Pakistan, which we think is very good, very progressive. And people, we need to support the organization yeah. actually who are pushing these uh, law and the boundaries of the Islamic limitations in Pakistan. Yeah. And of course, it's not just a question of Islam. I don't know if you've heard of the news of, um, obviously, it's been in the news a couple of times where Hasidic Jews have refused to sit next to women on flights. Uh, and there's, there's this wonderful 81-year-old woman who fled Nazi Germany who was asked to move on an El Al flight uh, because a Hasidic Jew refused to sit next to her. And she's taken uh, the, the airplane airline to court. Absolutely. She's joined a campaign to end segregations um, in um, Israel. And this has been a, a growing movement in Israel to end the power of the Orthodox uh, and Herodi uh, Jewish groups. Uh, within the public space, there was a fight a couple of years ago that went to Supreme Supreme Court of Israel um, to end segregation on buses, which was successful, a step forward, and this is an important fight on airlines. So, yeah, definitely. well done to yeah. the campaign to yeah. end segregations in Israel. Well, her name is Renee Rabinowitz, and we definitely support her and uh, you know hope that she does make headway into this area as well. I mean, speaking about gender segregation, there's another great case in Australia. It's, it was um, a complaint made by Alison uh, Bevage. She uh, complained about a meeting she attended in which Hezbollah Tahrir segregated men and women and made women sit at the back of the room. And she's won the court case. The, the Australian court said that gender segregation is discrimination against women. Of course it is. So I think the, uh, the movement against uh, segregation and defense of women's rights, it's actually it's an international movement. And we could see all these manifestations. We've had a fight against the um, universities UK who tried to justify segregation in universities meetings. And that was pushed back. And you could see all these different fronts that are actually fighting for women's rights. Yeah, and you know, the veil is one important symbol of this segregation between women and men. Uh, and of course, the fact that women are seen to be sources of fitna and chaos in society. And we just heard about a, a sort of tool that ISIS is using against women who are deemed to be improperly veiled. Uh, it's a sort of clipper that tears and cuts into one's flesh if you're not dressed as they choose. It reminds me of the um, Islamic regime um, attempt to f enforce um, veil on women in Iran and there were groups of Hezbollah herds roaming the streets of Tehran in the early 80s and they would actually they put pins on forehead of women who mm -hmm. whose sort of hijab or veil had actually gone a bit further and their forehead was shown to actually punish people to f enforce uh, veil and compulsory veil. Yeah, they had a slogan saying you either get a smack or you wear the headscarf. Naru sari, no, natu sari. It was a slogan. Um, acid was thrown in women's faces. Women were beaten, abused. And what we want to show you is, though, this resistance, this resistance that has been going on for over 36 years. But we want to show you video clips of a protest in Iran, in Tehran, on the 8th of March, International Women's Day, 1979, against uh, these new... Um, compulsory veiling laws in Iran and it is a magnificent thing to see so we wanted to show you a clip of that to remind you that today we're celebrating in this program 8th of March and this is a you know wonderful movement in Iran and in many places for equality for women's rights and against Islamic norms and rules watch this with us En passant devant l'hôpital, les femmes crient, saluent les infirmières, rejoignez-nous. Certains fanatiques religieux ont réagi très violemment aux manifestations des femmes, en les harcelant, en les injuriant et même en les frappant. Sima nous disait, oui, la semaine dernière j'étais en danger lorsque je descendais dans la rue parce qu'ils avaient demandé qu'on mette le tchador. J'avais mon foulard dans mon sac, j'en ai toujours un par sécurité. 
Des hommes dans chaque voiture qui passait disaient quelque chose. J'ai pensé que s'ils continuaient, j'agirais, je me défendrais. On a déjà fait des manifestations. Il y avait des soldats dans les rues, c'était le danger de mort. Maintenant, on peut marcher devant quelques hommes, on n'a plus peur. Earlier this week, I interviewed Tasnim Khalil when he was here to discuss his new book, Death Squads and State Terror in South Asia, for a meeting organized by Penn. Listen to this interesting interview about the situation in Bangladesh, particularly for free thinkers, and what we can do to support them. Stay with us. I wanted to first talk to you about Abhijit Roy. It is, has just been the first anniversary of his murder. Can you explain uh, a bit about what exactly happened and what the situation is now about those who actually took part in the killing? Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, yes, uh, we just, it was just a one year anniversary of the murder. And uh, as far as I understand, no one has really gone to trial or faced any kind of uh, justice. Uh, because of the killing. Uh, there are some other cases where we know that some people were arrested and recently the police cracked down on a house in Dhaka and they claim to have sort of destroyed the headquarters of uh, Ansar al-Islam in Dhaka, which I think is a good development, uh, but that's all there is and we have not heard anything about uh, any progresses in the investigations not only in Obijit's case but also other cases with uh, regards you know Abhijit's case and others uh, there does seem to be this sort of you know indiscriminate violence against free thinkers in Bangladesh is there also a sort of large amounts of solidarity in Bangladesh for free thinkers uh, free thinkers, uh, as as we know, are are usually called Nastiks or atheists in Bangladesh and among the general public. Uh, there is a growing movement of free thinkers, and uh, this is led by. Uh, this was led by OPJ, as you know. I mean, uh, he was the editor of Mukta Mona blog, and uh, uh, but after these killings. We can see that there is a new generation of free thinkers they are coming up, and that's an excellent thing. And uh, regarding the first part of your question, it's not really indiscriminate; it's very targeted. And uh, if, you, if you look, I have been uh, reading up on jihadi literature, which is available on the internet. They have their website and all that. Uh, and, and they're very focused what kind of person to kill, uh, who to kill, and why. Uh, these are followers of Anwar al Awlaki, the Imam, the uh, Imam who was droned and uh, assassinated by the United States a few years back. Uh, these are the same people, ideologically, they are the same group um, who attacked, uh, who, who carried out the Paris attacks. And uh, so these are very targeted and um, very organized attacks. And I don't, I, I fear they're not going to stop anything soon. So there is a list of people, as you say, that they're targeting. And the government seems to be completely, you know, not following through with trying to prosecute them. Why is that? Why, what's, why is that happening? Just to clarify, there is no public list. There are lists which we know of, you know, these lists are described as uh, hit lists and uh, all that. Uh, but uh, Ansar al-Islam, uh, to the best of my knowledge, never published uh, any public list. And that doesn't make sense also, you know. I'm not going to make a list and publish it if I'm targeting someone to kill. Uh, but there is a profile. That's, that's what I was trying to get at. Uh, anyone who writes about science, anyone who critically tries to examine Islamic texts and all that, they, they are uh, the targets. Uh, and why the government is not doing anything? Because there is a, 
you have to realize these are there are these are um, the people who are also spiritually uh, or ideologically aligned with the madrasas the Qaumi madrasas and the government is actually in an alliance of sorts with uh, hafazat islam right now uh, and uh, when hafazat islam came out on the streets <coughs> against the bloggers uh, i think back in 2013 the government was really afraid that now uh, there will be an islamic revolution or something uh, and 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 they, these people had to be taken care of and that was also really uh, unfortunate in a sense you had senior uh, clergy the mullahs and they were sending young children uh, madrasa students out to the streets as you know cannon fodder and um, so the government cracked down uh, a number of people died and then they actually entered into an alliance of sorts a very secretive uh, arrangements that as long as the government uh, does not allow any criticism of islam uh, any intellectual criticism of islam to go very far then hafazat is not going to come and 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 try to challenge the government and that's why you'll see that now they have also uh, arrested a publisher from a book fair and his only crime is publishing a book at a book fair um and he's as far as i know he's still in 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 detention right now um uh, and and this is going on and i don't see any 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 day uh, it will stop this uh, persecution about the huge secular movement in uh, bangladesh um is is there some sort of links between that movement and these free thinkers or being persecuted uh, no i mean one thing is there is a rise of two sorts of right wing in bangladesh one is uh, the secular nationalist right wing uh who talk about bengali nationalism and it's very ethno nationalistic uh, another is this hafazat islam madrasa uh, islamic right wing uh the free thinkers by the way i mean they are a very diverse group of people i mean there are people i don't agree with uh, because of their you know bigoted views on different things and all that Uh, that's okay uh, but they they are a very small group of people uh, mostly young and they try to write and discuss and talk about things that no mainstream uh, media outlet for example will, will even dare to touch um, so it's a, it's a, it's a very it's a very small group small growing group though yes So you know uh, there's been lots of international protests in defense of um, Arjit free thinkers do you think that's effective what else can be done to more effectively defend those who are at risk uh from outside I, I was asked the very same question I was doing a pan event uh, the other day and uh, that was organized by English pan and what I say that from outside Bangladesh I don't trust on governmental actions say like the british government or the american government because you know they have been uh, supporting repressive regimes in in bangladesh for for a very long time now but it is very important for organizations like yours uh, and 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 uh, activist organizations to stand beside the free thinkers of bangladesh not only by you know Uh, releasing statements or uh, petitioning someone uh, maybe i i find it laughable to you know send a petition to sheikh hasina for example she is not going to save anyone uh, but it's very important to give them platforms give them forum uh, if you have a magazine get a bangladeshi free thinker to write there if you have a i don't know uh, bread and bread and roses interview that person give that um give that platform because the 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 space for free thought in bangladesh is under constant attack and the, the one amazing thing about our age is that you you can have a discussion in london and that can have an impact in in whatever uh, lakshmipur or 
uh, other areas in Bangladesh also. So that is very important. That's where the support should focus on giving voices to the people who are uh, being persecuted because of their voices. So that's, I think, uh, crucial. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed that interview with Tasnim Khalil. I think one of the issues that's important here is that just recently in the news there's a discussion on how the Supreme Court in Bangladesh is now deciding whether to remove Islam as Bangladesh's state religion. It was something that was imposed in 1988, so that's not very long ago. And of course that would be a hugely important move if that happens. Absolutely, both for Bangladesh as well as the rest of the Islamic religion societies in Asia, uh, Middle East and North Africa. But that sets a precedence and that would be very welcoming. I mean, the other point that uh, Ta uh, Tasneem mentioned is that uh, the relationship between the ruling political powers, political parties, as well as the Islamic group, how they sort of work hand in hand continuously. Uh, so political groups, the main political parties, to remain in power, they compromise with uh, the Islamic groups and they recognize that they can act as a pressure uh, on the government. Yeah, and, and you do see that in, in many different countries, including even in Britain, don't yes. you? you? You see this sort of wheeling and dealing with the Islamists, which is why they are able to maintain power in, in the way that they do. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that he does mention is how important it is to support free thinkers, to support secularists in Bangladesh. And, you know, international pressure and international support must remain on the Bangladeshi government and give a space to the Bangladeshi free thinkers to be able to express themselves so the government can't or the Islamists cannot actually shut them out of the society because we live in a global world and it's important to use that opportunity and platform uh, to support the voice of free thinkers in Bangladesh. Yeah, and I mean, just as a final note, is not to forget the sacrifice and the importance of people like Abhijit Roy, the fact that, you know, their killers still need to be uh, held accountable, they need to be prosecuted, and that we need to demand justice for Abhijit and for the other free thinkers who have been killed by Islamists in Bangladesh without any real government accountability either. The insane, insane, insane fatwa of this week is from India. It's from Sunni Baralvi Markaz of Dargah Ala Hazrat, which has A issued name. very long name, usual, you know, stupid, stupid fatwa with long, long name. Uh, they've issued a fatwa against research findings on what Muslim women want. And uh, this uh, woman researcher at a law school uh, did some research with a hundred uh, Muslim women and she asked them about Sharia family law matters. 40% said they wanted a change in Sharia. 30% said they wanted the right to divorce. 80% said they wanted equal rights and property. And 20% said e, that's the, the period where you have to wait after a divorce before you can remarry. They want that changed. And of course, the Islamists they didn't came like out. it. No, Islamists came out, three muftis together. They started reading this and they thought about it. Sort of, it's against Islam. Again, another one. You cannot change Sharia law. Actually, it's wrong to, to undertake a survey. It's because... It, it's a negative survey. Oh, yes. And it's asked all the wrong questions because, you know... You yes, equality. That's a yeah. really wrong thing. <laughs> Having the right to divorce. That's a terrible thing. That's, you don't need that. This just embarrasses men. What is going on? <laughs> and they've basically said that Sharia law cannot be changed. And not only can it not be changed, no one even has the right to demand any form of amendment whatsoever. And people who've done that, they have no idea about <laughs> Islam and Sharia law. <laughs> be disagree. <laughs> This week's slice of life is from Gaza and it is women who are bicycling in a group together in various places in the public space and of course Hamas does not allow women to participate in sports in public, 
to bicycle after puberty. And so this is a wonderfully liberating thing to do. It's not really allowed, which is what makes it so brilliant. And the group of women coming out against Islamists, like many other places um, in, in Middle East and North Africa, women are forefront of fighting the Islamic rules and regulation. And you could see them cycling despite the rules of the Islamists yeah. in Gaza and different parts of Palestine. And what's interesting is, of course, they have been applauded by some and others have said, well, you know, they're women. They should be obeying their husbands and cooking food. Uh, and of course, uh, that's clearly uh, not what they're, they're doing. And we just wanted to wish them the best and, you know, just... Express our support for them. Express our support. And, and it is very exciting, exactly. It's really done. something to be celebrated. Anyway, we hope you've enjoyed this week's program. We uh, want to thank our patrons, people who've been donating to us, supporting our work, writing to us, commenting on our videos. We really appreciate all of your support and your feedback. Do keep watching us. Tell other people about our program. And I guess we'll see you again next week at the same time and same place. Until then, have a lovely week and long live 8th March. Good night. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.